This is going to be my final review of the OM-1. It's going to be what I, as an astrophotographer, think of this camera, especially the sensor. I'm going to show you some images in this one. We're going to do some direct comparisons with the EM-1X, the older sensors that were used by Olympus, show you exactly the science as to whether or not one sensor is better than the other, and if there have been improvements in the OM-1. I'll also tell you whether or not I think you should buy one. The OM-1 has been pretty much universally well accepted by everybody who's reviewed it, except for in one area, and that's the image quality. Some reviewers have said that the image quality is better, and some have said that it's no different than the older cameras. Well, I disagree with them, at least those that say there's no difference. And I, to do that, I did a lot of testing with this because I wanted to make sure that my data was good and solid before I actually came out and told you it's better or no. And this is, by the way, this annoys me about a lot of reviewers is they come out with a review a week after they get the camera. That's not enough time to test one of these things. You would need more time. I've been working with this camera and side by side testing it with all the previous IMX270 sensors that Olympus has used in the E1 Mark III, the E1X, and the E1 Mark II. Yes, testing, testing, testing a lot for, well, since the camera came out. And you can look at the release date of this video and see how long that is. Now, to do my tests, okay, the final ones that I did, and actually the images that I'm going to show you here in a second, I used the bigger scope up here. This is my 102 millimeter ED doublet. And yes, I did do a focal reducer thrown into the mix. And we did a side-by-side -side comparison. I used my EM1X, which was really the best, the finest uh, use of the older sensor that Olympus ever made, and the OM-1. And we used the exact same ISO, which was ISO 1000. I used daytime white balance, and then I used Adobe RGB for the color space, which is important when we start to run our stacking and so forth. I know for sRGB is typically what you use for most imaging situations, but in stacking, we use Adobe RGB because the algorithms can sometimes eliminate some data when they turn them into fits files to stack them. Gobbledygook, I know. <laughs> Now, the image that I'm going to show you, it's gonna be a picture of Orion, which I took on this, and let's switch over to the stump. Now, for the record, I actually did this test several times using several identical objects. Uh, I, I'm choosing this picture of Orion, and that's because, well, it's the one time that I had the absolute most stable conditions in the sky from one camera to the next as, as I did these images. Now, first, I'm going to show you, this is an unstretched image previewed in Alice type as it comes out of the stacking algorithm. And star size, it's kind of important. I was actually expecting the star size of the OM-1 to be a little bit bigger, but it actually isn't. It's actually slightly smaller. When I measured the width of the blown out area of the largest star in this picture, it's 78 pixels wide on the OM-1, whereas the EM-1X which uses the older two IMX270 sensor, it's 80 pixels wide. So there is an improvement, at least on a couple levels here, that you know are making stars smaller, which is absolutely what we want. We want stars to be smaller. Now that's a very small difference, but let's get into some of the more interesting stuff. And I'm gonna give you a few numbers and statistics here. With the OM-1, okay, our HFD numbers was 5.7, whereas the HFD number, which is your half with full maximum depth something of the star, it basically, it's, it's a bunch of math that involves star size and depth and brightness, I should say. Uh, for the EM-1X, it was 4.9. And this actually did initially surprise me because I was expecting the HFD number to be smaller, but then when I did a little bit more research on what HFD kind of means, uh, the fact that the number is higher in the EM-1X is indicative of the fact that, well, this is a sensor with greater quantum efficiency. In other words, it's basically absorbing more light from the sky than the older sensor was. And it's actually by a pretty significant margin. It's, you know, about 20%. Now this is where it gets interesting, okay? So the background value. Even though the OM-1 had slightly worse scene conditions, the background values are actually darker, and it's darker by a factor of three out of like, okay, the background value of the OM-1 was 491, whereas the EM-1X was 494. 
And well, what this essentially means is that the OM1 is more light pollution proof, if you will. In other words, you can you can do more with the OM1 in a more light polluted sky than you could with the EM1X. And then and then there's the number of stars that were detected. Okay, so the OM1 was able to pick up 965 stars in this image, whereas the EM1X was only able to pick up 887 stars. So yes, once again, greater quantum efficiency of the OM1, it's picking up more stars. Also the fact that the OM1 has a lower level of read noise is influencing the fact that while well, we can see those bright, those dimmer stars, I should say, that are in the background. Now, Sharpness. Now, even though the OM1 had slightly worse scene conditions while I was imaging with it, its sharpness value was 48.875, whereas the EM1X was 41.811. And that, once again, is indicative of the fact that the OM1 does have the ability to resolve details a little bit better. And I would say a lot of this has to do with the better RGB filters that are used on the OM1 because, you know, let's face it, Sony has made improvements in this area and has, you know, greatly improved <laughs> the RGB filter quality and cutoff values. Now, let's switch over to an actual image. So this is how they come out of the stacking algorithm. They're black, okay? And um, <laughs> yeah, let me stretch it for you now, okay? And so you can kind of see here, these two images have been, you know, set to zero and then stretched. They're in 32-bit mode. So when they come out of the stacking algorithm, they're in 32-bit. And they've been stretched exactly the same way. We have used the exact same histogram curves or cutoff values and also the exact same curves values. Now, it looks, the one on the left is the EM1X and the one on the right is the only one. And at first you're gonna say, well, the EM1X looks brighter. Actually, no, that's light pollution, okay? And this is because well, <laughs> the EM1X has fewer values of colors in between white and black that it can choose from. And because it has a smaller number of values, well, the dynamic range is smaller, the background is getting bright faster. Now, when I set the background value to black, okay, for both images, and we'll do it for you right now, what you're gonna see is that right away, if you can see this in, in YouTube's crushing algorithm, is that the Orion Nebula actually gets quite a bit smaller here. And that's because, well, we can't resolve as much faint detail with the older sensor as we can with the newer one. Yeah, there's actually, all, or the nebula here is basically twice the size using the OM1. And also, <laughs> what I want to point out to you is the center. Okay, the very center of Orion, it's very bright part of the sky. And typically you need to do HDR type effects in order to kind of rescue the center of this image. Now, I haven't done that here, and that's because I want you to see these two. You know, if you look at the EM1X versus the OM1 image, uh, the OM1 actually still has lots of details, even in the very bright center of the core, whereas the EM1X has basically lost them, which once again is basically a loss of dynamic range because you know the sensor is in fact inferior. Now to, to sum up all this okay what what have we seen improve with the OM1 over the EM1X? Well basically it's about for astrophotography at least it's about a one-stop improvement. We have seen a, a one-stop improvement it takes uh, a little bit less integration time in order to capture the same image of the OM1 versus the older sensors that were used in the EM1 Mark III and the EM1X. Now, uh, by the way, these images were a total, they were exactly the same amount of exposure time. There were 49 images stacked together. They were 60 second in each, which equals 2,940 something seconds. Battery life. Yes, astrophotography, it's pretty tough on battery life. You're in the cold and usually you're imaging for a very long time. Now, with the new OM1 and the dual battery grip there, I'm actually able to start my imaging session about six o'clock at night and continue imaging on until about 4.30 in the morning. And yes, this is even when temperatures get down into the single digits Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold Celsius. 
Now, the EM1X and the EM1 Mark II and the EM1 Mark III before, even with two batteries, I couldn't do half a night in those kind of conditions. So battery life has dramatically been improved. Now, there is though a, one big drawback here. One of the cool things about the OM1, and it's a nice thing and it's a drawback at the same time. The, the USB, it allows you to power the camera and charge the batteries. Here's the thing, when it gets below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, the batteries absolutely will not charge, okay? Uh, there must be a temperature sensor in the batteries that detects that it's too cold and they simply will not charge, which is a shame. I wish it was minus 20 Celsius, which is actually the standard for a lot of other situations. A lot of lithium ion batteries have a, sen a temperature sensor built into them that prevents them from charging in extremely cold weather because, well, you know, at temperatures under minus 20 Celsius, you can have explosion issues. But, you know, usually it's minus 20. With the OM1, unfortunately, they set it to about freezing, which is honestly kind of high, okay? And what that means is that I'm kind of stuck in cold weather at least, still using two batteries, just for the sake, when your batteries are completely dead, your camera will not run off of USB power. Which means that, okay, even if you're running the whole night long on USB power, once the batteries die, just because of the coldness of the weather, well guess what? You're done imaging. And you're not gonna be able to image again until you warm the batteries up, so at least they're above freezing point. Now, with the EM1X and also the EM1 Mark II and the EM1 Mark III, uh, we had this, we had a, a DC port on the side here which allowed us to power the cameras. And I found that these things, they work regardless of what the temperature is outside. Even when I'm in single digits Fahrenheit, I, I've had no problems running them. And also, this guy will, with the EM1X, it would charge both batteries uh, fairly quickly, actually, because, you know, this is nine volts, five amps, so it's it's giving it quite a bit of power. And these things were cheap, too. Like, I actually don't carry a battery charger with me anymore. I just carry this guy with me when I'm using the EM1X because I just plug this in, and he charges very fast. Now, these guys, the EM1 Mark II and EM1 Mark III, of course, they don't charge using this guy the battery grip but you can at least power the camera those are my only complaints about the battery in the om1 is that it seems to be pretty sensitive to cold weather at least the uh the firmware that's inside of it you know is pretty sensitive and it likes to turn itself off in the cold so it's kind of something to watch for and just something to be aware of you want to make sure that you start your session with the, your battery is fully charged and run off of power so that, you know, throughout the night, hopefully the batteries will stay charged the entire night long. Now, I wanna show you a little pet peeve that I've had for years with the viewfinders in these cameras. This is the viewfinder off the EM1 Mark II and Mark III, and it's also the same one that's on the EM1, the original Mark I. These things are awful. They're painful to hold up your eye. I've actually cut myself on these things. Now, another thing, was that there was this lip that went all the way around the viewfinder. So that when you're trying to clean it with a microfiber cloth, all it does is push the dirt to the edge and it gets kind of caught in there. Now, the EM1X was a much better eye cup design, way more comfortable, and it does come off a little bit easier. These things, you, I've actually broken them taking them off. They're hard to get on, hard to get off. And, with the EM1X, there was actually a low spot that they put at the top so that as you swiped upwards, you could actually kind of push the dust off of it. Now with the OM1, they've actually gone the next step. This low spot is on the top and it's on the bottom, which means that wiping the dust off of it, you can go kind of either direction and it works great. It's just one of those little kind of design touches that was, you know, they were thinking about the photographer and the actual function and use of the equipment. And then of course there's also, this right here, it's got, 
two levers on each side, which just makes taking this thing off so easy. But at the same time, this thing doesn't ever come off by accident. So I have a passing interest in wildlife photography, which I know is kind of something that Olympus is really pushing now. It's a, it's a niche that they're really getting into, and I think deservably they should be. In the past, I've, with the older cameras, I was willing to, and, and used basically ISO 3200 as my, my maximum. Okay, that's, that's as high as I was willing to go and consider that you know, image quality was still good enough for me to, to keep and enjoy looking at my pictures afterwards. Now with the new OM-1, basically I'm able to use ISO 6400 now and I don't hesitate at all using that ISO. And then there's also, if I really want to push it and I get desperate, I will use ISO 12800 now. Especially with some of the new noise AI software that's out there, I can really recover a lot. And yes, I can still apply that to these images here as well with the older cameras, but they just don't quite look as good as they do with the OM-1. Yeah, I feel like I've gained roughly two stops basically with the OM-1. Yeah, that, that's kind of my perspective on at least daytime terrestrial use of the LM1. Astrophotography, I feel like I've gained about one stop, basically half the amount of integration time to get the same image. And with daytime photography, in a lot of respects, using the new AI software, I feel like I've gained two and sometimes three stops. Uh, I, obviously, I've already touched on another video of mine about the temperature stability of this camera. It is the best one so far even though it does in fact run a little bit hotter but there's just there's just so many things about the OM1 that are really kind of neat a couple of other things that I like about the OM1 is I do like the new ergonomic feel of the OM1 I think it really is better I know the dials are a little bit harder to reach in the OM1 but in my opinion this is a good thing because with the EM1 Mark III I noticed that I hit these dials a lot on accident also and here's something that you know, I kind of experienced having having had some EM1s that I've had for a very long time, all the way back to the first generation, is that these open dials, they don't last as long as recessed dials do. And that, I think, is a benefit that we will see long term. And that's something that you're not really... You don't hear it being talked about just yet, but you know, trust me, 10 years from now, you're gonna love the fact that these are recessed dials because they are more reliable and they last longer. Now, a couple of the other things that I like about the new OM-1 is one thing, I just, I love the shape and everything. The looks at first, I didn't quite know if I really liked them. It didn't have that traditional kind of look like the older cameras do. I still think that these kind of are prettier a little bit, the older ones at least, but in a lot of respects, you know, the new camera, it has that kind of professional look to it that you really need. And it has a, it has a form follows function kind of uh, aesthetic to the design, which I think is a step in the right direction. All right, let's give you a sum total of all things here. Should you buy the OM-1 for astrophotography? My answer is actually no. If you're going to buy a camera that is just for astrophotography, <laughs> Just get a cool camera, guys, okay? Get a dedicated camera. These things are so much better. This guy here is mono. This is a one-shot color. This guy is eight years older than this sensor, and yet this thing will absolutely spank the OM-1. That's, that's my thinking on whether or not you should buy this guy just for astrophotography. Now, if you need a camera, to kind of do everything. You know, you need to do wildlife photography, you need to take pictures of your kids like I do, you need it for video, you want to do some astrophotography as well. Well, then I think that the OM-1 is the most astrophotography friendly camera that Olympus has ever made. And in that respect, it comes the most recommended from me. But if you want to do real astrophotography, uh, really a dedicated camera is the way to go. But that's if you're really interested in astrophotography. If you've got money and budget and time to invest in learning how to use these things because it really is a very different world.
So that red guy over there, that's my newest Four Thirds camera. It's an IMX 492 sensor, which is a backside illuminated sensor, but it's also mono. It's 40 megapixels, actually 44. Should be interesting to have some fun with him in the future. Uh, this guy right here, this is the IMX 269. This is the same sensor that's found in the Pen F, which I'm gonna do a video soon, kind of comparing those two cameras together to see what a consumer grade camera and what a dedicated camera can do in astrophotography using the exact same sensor. Now, if you like this kind of content, I've got a couple other videos here that you might find interesting about the Olympus OM-1 sensor, but also, I know I didn't recommend this camera just for doing astrophotography, more for like, if you kind of want to do everything. And yeah, I am, I'm actually buying a second OM-1. That's how much I like it. And oh, my, my EM-1X, I, I'm gonna have to finally retire that because I can, I really can only afford to carry around two cameras in my camera bag at the same time. Although I'm holding on to the EM-1X, I'm not letting that guy go.